When I was in high school, I had an economics teacher who would have this up on the projector the majority of days that we walked into class. He was a libertarian, owned a lot of gold, a very doom and gloom type of guy. He thought the U.S. government's current fiscal policy was not a sustainable model. He would tell us all types of scary stuff. China's going to take over the world. Just all the typical stuff that you hear in the news nowadays. So, as I'm sure you all know, debt to GDP just passed 100%. Does this mean we're going to end up like Greece, have rioting, have hyperinflation? Are we doomed to the reckless spending of our parents and grandparents? So I'd like you to take a second and guess what you think the percentage of the total U.S. debt that is owned by China. So this is the percentage of the roughly 19 trillion that's owned by China. So this is a pie chart of that breakdown of who owns the U.S. debt as of 2016. So as you can see, we have China over here at 6.9%. So most people, when I ask them that question, they guess anywhere between 30 and 50%, but it is, it is much lower than most people would guess. And another shocking thing is that 68% of U.S. debt is owned domestically. Now, this is either by U.S. citizens, Social Security Fund, or the Fed, but in, in one form or another, it is owned by uh, a United States-affiliated entity. And this is, this is good for many reasons. It's not, it's not great. It's not that much better than it being internationally owned. It's still debt, but... Um, it definitely means that we have more ability to enact control over what happens to our debt. So this graph uh, is showing the inverse relationship between the massive spike in debt from 1995 up to 2012. As you can see, it's uh, quadrupled, and as of today, it's actually up five times what it was then, because we're almost at 20 trillion. But during the same period of time, the average interest rate that we pay on that debt has plummeted as well. So even though we owe four times as much, we're paying about a third of what we used to be paying. And that is pretty incredible. Um, basically, our, our cost of capital has become extremely low. Um, people trust us. People love loaning us money because we do a very good job of paying it back. So these are a couple of, couple of good, good graphs here. Uh, over here, we're looking at percent of US uh, budget that goes towards uh, interest payment. And as you can see, we had some real big spikes here up to 15%, 1950, uh, and in 1990 going into, into 2000. And this is, this is crazy. This is a very large number that I feel like wasn't talked about back then uh, as much as it is now. And even our total uh, amount paid um, to paid to service our debt is, is 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 lower now than what it was back then, which is extremely interesting. Most people didn't would not be aware of that. So this is a very busy graph over here, but there's a lot of really good information here. So just by looking at it, what would you guess is the um, is the least consistent indicator here? And it's obviously growth, right? And this is pretty interesting. Uh, the federal government does or tries to keep growth um, positive and steady. And they don't have, well, they, they, they try to exert control over it, but they fail. Um, it's just hard. Uh, economies have so many moving parts. It's hard to know what's going on. Sometimes it's just going to go where it wants to go. And that's why there's, it's, so, it's so all over the place. So growth is the one thing that we want to keep as high as possible. That keeps us in a fiscally sound position. Interest is something that we want to keep as low as possible, right? That's literally what we're paying to maintain our debt load. So we want that to be as low as possible. Inflation uh, is much more complicated. So inflation is good for servicing the debt in that um, as inflation goes up, uh, our debt is worth less. So we're paying back dollars that are worth less 
which is good for the U.S. government. Um, and this is a tactic that almost all uh, federal reserves and governments use to uh, make it easier to pay back their debt over time. But the issue, obviously, is if inflation gets too high, uh, it messes with how the economy runs. Uh, it's, it can be really bad for the consumer. It can reduce their purchasing power. So it's a very, very fine line to walk. Uh, and it just makes the situation very dynamic. But as you can see throughout history, there's a rough trend of these things uh, staying staying together. And as of late, they've really started to, to come together and trade similarly. Um, the big difference being in 2008. But um, as long as none of these indicators get too out of whack, the main thing we don't want to see is interest spike up and inflation and growth not go along with it. But um, as long as they stay roughly clustered together, that's a very good sign. So this is, this is an extremely interesting graph. Um, it's telling you uh, how much of the debt is sold for a given time interval. So the most common, um, the most common maturities are the one year and one to five year. And uh, this is most likely because investors don't wanna take the risk of uh, interest rates doing something crazy uh, over the next 20 to 30 years while only securing an additional 1%. So as you can see, we have one year here at 1.22, five at 1.84. Going up to these 20, 30 year bonds, you're only looking at a little bit over 1% uh, more interest per year and you're taking on a large risk. But another good thing is that if interest rates do stay low, then the US government can continue to, to borrow a majority of short-term debt which means that we only have to keep our GDP higher than these short-term numbers instead of keep our GDP higher than these numbers, which is much easier to do for a massive economy like ours. This is a really fascinating graph. So there's a, there's a lot going on here, but we're gonna focus on the US. But um, as you can see, there's a big correlation between uh, credit rating given by Standard and Poor's and Moody's and uh, debt to GDP ratio. So countries that have higher debt to GDP ratios are more likely to have uh, AAA credit rating or just a high credit rating in general. And a lot of this is kind of like chicken or egg situation. So these countries that are known to be fiscally sound and are always good about paying back their debt, they, ha they then get rewarded with a low with a high credit rating, which then means they can borrow cheaply. Countries who can borrow cheaply decide to borrow. And that's basically what we see here. Um, it's kind of a recurring thing. And uh, focusing on the US specifically, this was a few years ago, so debt to GDP ratio is under 90% at this time. But um, it says that the interest payment, uh, the average interest payment for us is right at 2.5%. And if we can keep our GDP between two and three percent, or close to that, um, it's 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 a pretty sustainable model. Um, as long as we don't let our interest rates spike up too much, it's not it's not as dire of a situation as people depict. So this is uh, this is similar to that last graph, and I'd like to ask you, where would you rather live? Would you rather live in the green shaded countries or in the red shaded countries? and most people by and large would choose the red. And that's because these countries have a higher standard of living, more opportunity, uh, they're a lot more mobile um, in, in, their, in the society. And a lot of that is because these countries have borrowed a good bit of money and they've spent it. Sometimes they spend it stupidly, sometimes they spend it well. But when money is as cheap as 1% a year, you don't have to spend your money that well uh, for it to be worth it to, to keep borrowing more. So a lot of people love to make the comparison uh, of government debt to household debt. They get extremely self-righteous. They say that their house is in order. They don't carry any debt. Uh, they don't spend more than they make. They live within their means. Um, as if this is like a moral or ethical argument. And they're just making a generally bad comparison here. So. A better comparison would be a country to a corporation, and this is because corporations can hire new employees, um, just as countries can increase their, their population uh, from where they're gathering taxes. Whereas when you add a new member to your household, 
that could be a 20% gain to your population. You know, you can't really have a one or 2% gain to your household population. It's just, it's just impossible unless you have a absolutely massive family. So the comparison is not good at all. So at the moment, the US is functioning like Amazon. Yes, we're spending a lot of money, but only because the market trusts us to, to always pay that money back and to spend it relatively wisely and get a good return on our investment. The other strategy would be like a more conservative company such as Coke and borrow less money, but also return more money to shareholders, not reinvest that money and not try to grow. But the US's current strategy is to try to stay competitive globally and um, to keep this thing going. The U.S. has to grow.